the Joe Rogan experience. I was talking to a friend of mine about imposter syndrome. That um, imposter syndrome. Yeah, you know that feeling. You know expression. No. It's you, you get it when like when people think that you're really good at something and you don't have a lot of self-worth or you 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 have this perception of yourself that you're not worthy right you know like maybe as an artist that's that's a big one that you have it as an artist like i had it forever as a comedian and i probably still have it a little bit but less so than i used to because i'm just more accomplished and more understanding of what it is and the more engrossed in the process and i i I know what it is now more than I did before. Okay. And you, like when I meet famous people, if they know who I am, I'd be like, oh my God, I got to get out of here. This fucking person knows who I am. I'm tricking them. Right. It's a trick. They don't know. You know. And they're like, hey man, I love your stuff. I'm like, no, you don't. You think you right. do. You don't. Trust me. Let me get away from you. Right. <laughs> it's like this imposter thing. And then sometimes things, enough things happen where you go, you know what? I think I might be legit. I think I might be legit. Like, this is so crazy. Like, I thought I was an imposter forever, but I think I'm, I'm going to relax and just tr concentrate on the work and not worry about whether or not I'm an imposter anymore. And nice. just concentrate on the work. That ego is always there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's always there, man. And, but it, the, the ego, it's interesting. <laughs> imposter syndrome is often more prevalent in people who are legitimately talented. And for some strange reason, because when you're legitimately talented, one of the ways you become legitimately talented is to be ruthlessly self-critical. Because that's that's how you get really good at something, and in ruthless self, like I remember, um, uh, Cat Williams was talking about himself once, and Cat Williams, who's a crazy person but a brilliant comedian, and he said something that I, I have always thought, and he's like, "I'm not a fan of me," and he goes, "He goes like I don't, you know, I don't particularly like me," you know, I was hmm. like, "That is why he's great." Because that makes you work so hard. At, like The worst thing a comedian can be in the beginning is sure of themselves and then incompetent at the same time. It's horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> because you're not good, but you think you're amazing. And then you understand. You don't know why the world doesn't think you're amazing. Because you think you're great. Because you're delusional. You have this sort of artificial image of the world that you've put up and in the world you are the center you are the center and you want everything to evolve around you and it's the worst thing in terms of for comedy you people have to enjoy what you're doing they have to enjoy and not not everyone's gonna you're always gonna have some people that don't enjoy no matter what but you're trying to make it an enjoyable experience for the people watching you now if you are d delusional and clueless and if you you don't understand how people see you, you you have a distorted perception of reality, distorted perception of your own, your own your own presence. It fucks up the vibe for the audience. It fucks up they 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 recognize it too quickly because comedy, in a weird way, is a spiritual pursuit for the person who's making it. Because you're putting together thoughts and ideas and you're trying to get it into these people's minds in a way that elicits a response that makes them feel good. Mm. And the only way that you could really do it is you have to hit those notes. You have to reach that, that resonance. You have to find that frequency, whatever it is that works on them. And you can't be thinking about yourself too much. In, you can't be pleased with yourself. Can't be happy with yourself. You always have to be analyzing. You are you are the the sculptor. You have to be critical. You know, always have to. And so, in doing that, it's really easy to develop imposter syndrome. Because even when you're think, doing well, you know, like fucking, I've had like I don't know nine or ten comedy specials. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many people like them. They, they suck. I got to keep going. Right. You got to keep working at it's it. Like a like sick you, type of so when, yeah perfectionism. Yeah. So when someone would. I don't remember how we even got onto this, but that imposter syndrome exists because your your ego won't like your mind understands that your ego will fuck this up. 
if you, if you let your ego say, "Oh, I'm the fucking man," you're gonna ruin this whole thing. Mm. Like you have to you have to be aware of what this is. Like this 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 ride requires you to stay within a certain frequency. You have to stay inside that frequency. As soon as you start going, "Yeah, everything's fucking awesome," <laughs> it all goes away. All of it goes away. You have to stay inside that frequency, and that frequency is not a frequency where you're very pleased with yourself. Um. I think you've gone for full circle back to the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. Because the Bhagavad Gita is the warriors have to fight the war. You think it's you think the Bhagavad Gita is going to be like, here's Krishna telling Arjuna not to fight. Mm-hmm. Arjuna doesn't want to fight. He's got his guru on the other side. He's got his family on the other side. Um, what's Krishna going to say about this? And Krishna's saying, you got to actually fight. You're born to fight. Mm. You just have to get out of your ego with this. And you have to do it as just a service. And I think when I... Uh, apply that type of teaching to my life. Like sometimes I'm not a great singer. I'm not a great, uh, you know, Indian classical music, but I like to do it and I'm enthusiastic to it. And to me, it's a, it's not about me. Uh, it's about like sort of like an offering. It was like one, one of the first teachings I got in the ashram was um, when you're on stage, don't do it to make sure you're doing it to serve God and not be God. Mm. That statement changed my entire life. Yeah. And I was like, oh shit, everything I do is to be God. Everything. And it changed the way, it didn't just change the way I sang, it changed the way I parent, changed the way I like react to, to friends, to fans, to my parents. Yeah. Um, it, it was powerful. So that I have to sometimes, you know, I like to publicly sing on this. Have you ever heard Kirtan? No. It's so interesting. What is it? It's, it's 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 um, chanting back and uh, call and response chanting uh, of chanting mantras and you use like this pump piano and Indian drums. I'll play hmm. I'll play some for you later. Okay. And uh, but it's great and it's popular in America. It's been sort of very a little bit Americanized, mm. but it's but it's good and uh, it's great. And so what we do on pilgrimages. I have, I have my assistant's an incredible drummer. He's from India, uh, and then I ha- I play the harmonium, which is a pump piano. And uh, we just sing publicly, call and response, and all the in- Indian people in India will come around and they'll sing with us. And it's, it's like, it's overwhelming. So there's one particular temple I go to in one particular holy place where singers come from around the world. It's like basically, you know, Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin. It's like the best kirtan singers from around the world come and they sing. And I remember one time I came with a bunch of students of mine and they called me up to sing. And in my brain, I was like, hey, you guys are like the real deal. I don't want to sing. And they're like, no, 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 you sing. And I was like, no, seriously, I don't want to sing. Please, you sing. And like thousands of pilgrims come in at the time. And somehow I have felt like I have to do this. I have to sing because that's what they're ordering me to do. I have to do it in a loving way. I have to do it in a way to make everybody excited, but I can't do it with any ego whatsoever. And it becomes like this incredible tightrope walking. Mm, yeah. Can I do my best with? A, can you get on stage? Yeah. And not, it's not about me uh, as the great comedian. You know, mm-hmm. can I do that sort of as an offering where I feel like people are going to walk away with something and they're going to be changed a little. They're going to be lifted a little. They're going to go home a little bit more connected. It's going to help me and it's going to help them. And can I do it when and when people? We have this thing where we say uh, we deflect our praise. People say, hey, great sh- uh, you're a great yoga teacher. Um, this is how I train my students. You're a great yoga, uh, that was a great thing you did. Our, our quick answer is, by the mercy of my teachers. Like we don't want to hold on to praise because b- praise exacerbates the ego. Yeah. And so we immediately want to say, and it's not even like we're being falsely humble. We actually are made up of the teachers in my life. All the people that have loved me, cared for me. Um, maybe people have like screwed with me, but they also taught me a lesson. So the yogi's conception is everybody is creating what I am. And therefore I don't own any of this. You want to praise me? I'm going to give the praise back to my teacher. Now the teacher's mood is by the mercy of my teacher. I, I look at back at my life and I've realized I'm just like a ball of energy and generally, the energy goes to like feed my ego. How can it feed my ego? How can I use that to manipulate girls, to, to people like me? How can I use everything I've g- got gifted 
for my own right. self-aggrandizement. Of course. And so when you get these teachers in your life, spiritual teachers who sort of like give you a loving slap or a loving, hey, and they turn you on in some way, they take what you already have and they redirect that north instead of south. Everything I was doing was just a snowballing devastation. And now you can you don't re, you don't give up those qualities that you have, but you use them in a way that brings people up instead of brings them down. That's what we were saying about movies too, mm. or any entertainment or, or sounds in our that, mind. That state of mind that you're trying to achieve when you get on stage, where you're trying to sing with no ego. That's exactly the, the the frequency that you have to hit when you're doing comedy. You do your best, but you don't do your best so that people love you. You do your best because that's Cause what you're your, trying to do. That's your craft. That's your this is this is your thing, your thing that you do. Your your expression, your art form. You have to manage it, and the way to manage it correctly is you ha you can't you can't go out there with ego. You'll turn people off. They won't feel it. You you know. There's moments where you can use that, especially with comedy. Where you turn, but and, it's not ego. It's but, like, but even if you're doing it though in comedy, you're doing it for the effect of making people laugh. You're not right. doing it for the effect of p pumping yourself up, and you have to be very careful about that. And if they know that that's what you're doing, they will accept it. That's the, that's the art of it. Yes, that's the art of it. It's a dance. Perfect. There's a strange sort of dance that goes on. I I would notice this is humiliating to mention, but I, I will. If I wasn't doing it in a mood of service as an offering, if I got off stage and that wasn't my motivation, I'd be depressed. Yeah. Because, and maybe you can relate to this, on stage, I'm the center, I'm the coolest, I'm, I'm it. They're singing song lyrics I wrote mm -hmm. on my bed and now they're all singing them and then I'm in another country. Right. Now I'm off stage and I'm a nobody. So if you're not medicating with any type of drug or sex, mm. then all you're left with is a bunch of emotions. Interesting. And I, I, I don't know if this is true, but I, I think this is why people who are entertainers can, can move towards addiction or way, yes. ways to mask that, that loneliness that comes with being the center where the whole world is trying to convince you of the Maya. You've heard that word Maya? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The illusion. The illusion of life is that you are the center. 